reading from Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, Aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. And then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. <clears throat> Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Thanks, Ernie, for reading us of that passage. Uh, today is Pentecost. And uh, on Pentecost, we celebrate the fact that Jesus sent his Holy Spirit to empower his church. And we just read the story of how that happened first in Acts chapter 2. Now, I was asked to repeat a sermon that I uh, gave about three, four years ago. And uh, it was about praying in the Spirit. Now, I, this is a similar one. It's not the, exactly the same. Uh, but uh, here goes. My, uh, my first job was working for uh, a great big Hungarian fellow who, whose accent was so heavy, I couldn't understand. My, the, my first day, he explained what I was supposed to do. I don't know what, I didn't know a thing that he said. Fortunately, my, my friend was with me and he explained, this is, he's asked us to do these things. And uh, a couple of days later, I was there by myself and I understood, he gave me five things to do and I understood four of them, but the fifth one I had no idea. Now, how do you think that would have worked if I would have said, okay, I'll just do these four and this fifth one. I don't know what it is, so I won't do anything. That probably wouldn't have gone over so well, right? Well, how about the same with the Bible? Sometimes I think there's, there's commands or instructions that we have in the Bible that we don't necessarily understand. We might, you know, how would it go if we, under, okay, we understand all of these ones. We'll do that. But this thing here, we don't understand, so we'll just ignore it. How would that go over? <laughs> not so, not necessarily so great. I was wondering if anybody was alive out there. Uh, 
Okay, there's a command that's repeated twice in the New Testament. And I, uh, often I think people don't quite understand, especially in our circles, don't understand what that command is. The command is to pray in the Spirit. Look at Ephesians 6, verse 18. It says, pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Uh, I understand that verse to be saying that all of our praying is to be in the Spirit. It's not that we pray sometimes in the Spirit and sometimes not in the Spirit, but all of our praying, all prayers, all occasions, all kinds of prayers, we are to pray in the Spirit. The second place this command appears is in Jude, verse 20. It says, But you, dear friends, build yourselves up in the most holy faith and pray in the Holy Spirit. Now, I ask you, what does it mean to pray in the Spirit, pray in the Holy Spirit? Uh, over the years, I've, I've asked lots of people, what does that mean? Every time I read a book on the Holy Spirit, I see if they have a chapter on praying. And, and every time I read a book on prayer, I, I look to see if they have a, a chapter on the Holy Spirit. And I found normally two answers to this question. What does it mean to pray in the Spirit? Two answers. One answer comes from my charismatic friends and from charismatic books that I've read. And the answer is praying in the Spirit equals praying in tongues. And praying in tongues equals praying in the Spirit. Now, I have friends that pray in tongues. My guess is some of us here this morning pray in tongues. Uh, praying in a heavenly language that you haven't learned and you don't understand and it's inspired by the Spirit, surely that's got to be part of what it means to pray in the Spirit. But I do not accept that praying in tongues covers nearly all of what the Bible means by praying in the Spirit. There is much more to praying in the Spirit than simply praying in tongues. I say this for, for two reasons. The first one is... These verses command all of us. God expects all of us to pray in the Spirit. But the Bible is also very clear that not all of us are going to speak in tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, Paul asks a series of questions that have an obvious answer, and the obvious answer is no to all of these. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The answer is no. So the Bible expects all of us to pray in the Spirit, but it's also very clear that not all of us, in fact, the majority of us here, are not the kind who speak in tongues. There's more to praying in the Spirit than praying in tongues. The second reason I say that is Paul gives instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Paul gives instructions to those who pray in tongues. And he encourages them to pray in two ways. He says to pray in a tongue, and then he says to pray with one's mind. In other words, in a language that they can understand, a language that they've learned. And so he's saying that all of our praying is to be in the Spirit, and yet some of it is in tongues and some of it's in a language that it's with our mind. It's in a language we understand. So I do not accept that praying in the Spirit equals praying in tongues. It's, it's much more than that. So the first, I, I so go back a little bit. I, I've asked people, what does praying in the Spirit mean? The first uh, answer I get is praying in the Spirit equals praying in tongues. The second answer I get is basically, I don't know. I, I, uh, if you read books about this uh, and they have a chapter on it, it uh, sometimes it's, it's so vague, you can't figure out what in the world it means. And in our circles, praying in the Spirit, what does that mean? Kind of, that's what often comes out. And so there was quite a long period of time where I searched for an answer. What does this mean? And so this morning I want to show you uh, what I've learned about this from the New Testament and what I've, I tell you a little bit about what I've learned by experience of what it means to pray in the Spirit. 
Now, to help us understand what it means to pray in the Spirit, let me ask you, what would be the opposite of praying in the Spirit? What's the opposite of praying in the Spirit? No, do not pray. Janelle's great answer, do not pray at all. Okay, uh, the Bible talks about walking in the Spirit. What they mean by walking is the way you live your life. In the Spirit, they mean in obedience, in alignment with what uh, what the Holy Spirit, what God is asking you to do. So walking in the Spirit is living your life in obedience to God and under the prompting, the leading of the Holy Spirit. The Bible is clear. What's the opposite of walking in the Spirit? Walking in the, in the flesh. Okay, the flesh is the Bible's way of talking about our, our selfish, sinful nature that, that we were born with. And so, if I'm going to walk in the Spirit, I'm going to uh, live my life in obedience to God and in uh, following Him. If I'm going to walk in the flesh, it means I'm going to live my life according to my selfish, sinful nature. So the opposite of walking in the Spirit is walking in the flesh. What's the opposite of praying in the Spirit? Praying in the flesh, which means that my sin, my, my, sin, my prayer originates with my own selfish, sinful desires. That's what it means to pray in the flesh. And so you can see that God would want us to always be praying in the Spirit. All of our praying is in the Spirit. He doesn't want us to be... Praying in the flesh is basically uh, talking to ourselves, I think. So uh, I want to talk to you about three attitudes that we need to have in prayer that lead us towards praying in uh, the Spirit. The first attitude is that you admit that you don't know what and how to pray. Now, this may surprise you. You know, we feel that, you know, maybe we've been Christians for a while and we've prayed lots of times. And, uh, you know, like how hard can praying be? Praying is just talking to God. So surely you'd think we would know how to pray. But do we? Say uh, a good friend of yours works downtown. And this Friday, his boss or her boss said, you know, you can take off an hour early, but on your way home, I want you to deliver this package. It's really, really important that this package get to this address today. And so your friend takes off from work an hour early. On the way home, going to deliver this package, but... He needs to stop at the drugstore, and he does. And he gets a little bit excited about a sale in there and buys some stuff and then starts heading home, just about home, and remembers this package. Looks through his car. No package. Doesn't want to get fired from his sweet job. So he phones you in a panic. Now, in that situation... Do you know what to pray for when it comes to praying for him? Now, of course, we're going to pray that he find the package. (laughs) That it turns out all right that he doesn't get fired, right? But look at what Paul says. We'll, We'll come back to this. Romans 8. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how to pray the Spirit, or how we ought to pray. And some translations say we don't know what we ought to pray. The word can be translated both into English both as how and what. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that words cannot express. And God, who sees into our hearts, knows the, what the thought of the Spirit is because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. Paul is saying he doesn't know how or what he ought to pray. And so we begin with the attitude that says, I don't know how or what to pray. Now let's make this real practical. Now, in the case of our friend with the package, our friend asks us, will you pray for me? 
He's in a panic. Will you pray for me? And our immediate response is, well, of course I'll pray for you. And we assume that we know what it is that we're supposed to pray. But what is it we really know? What we really know is we know what we want. We, want, we know what he wants. He wants to find that package. And we assume that what we want is what we should pray. But we don't necessarily know what God's answer is to that prayer. And we can't just assume that what we want is what we should pray. According to Romans 8, there are lots of times when we do not know what or how to pray. Does that mean we shouldn't pray? Of course not. It means the, the, the way this normally works out is we pray. Where we start is we pray for what we want. But we need to be open to the idea of allowing the Holy Spirit to teach us, to lead us, so that we pray according to what God wants, so that we know what and how to pray. The Holy Spirit desires to teach us to pray. True prayer is prayer that the Holy Spirit inspires and directs. When we come to prayer, we should recognize that we don't know how or what to pray. We look to Him to lead us. I like the way R.A. Torrey puts it. I'm going to read a, a little bit of a lengthy quote from him, but this is, this is what he wrote. Nothing can be more foolish in prayer than to rush heedlessly into God's presence and ask the first thing that comes to our mind. When we first come into God's presence, we should be silent before Him. We should look to Him to send His Holy Spirit to teach us how to pray. We must wait for the Holy Spirit uh, and surrender ourselves to the Spirit. Then we will pray correctly. He goes on to talk about his own experience. He says, Often when we come to God in prayer, we do not feel like praying. What should we do in such a case? Cease, pray cease praying until we feel like it? No, not at all. When we least feel like praying is the time when we need it the most. We should wait quietly before God and tell Him how cold and prayerless our hearts are. We should look up to Him, trust Him, and expect Him to send the Holy Spirit to warm our hearts and to draw us out in prayer. It will not be long before the glow of the, Spir the Spirit's presence will fill our hearts. We will begin to pray with freedom, directness, earnestness, and power. Many of the most blessed seasons of prayer I have ever known have begun with the feeling of utter deadness and prayerlessness. But in my helplessness and coldness, I have cast myself upon God and looked to Him to send His Holy Spirit to teach me to pray. And in the end, He has always done it. That's the end of the quote. So first of all, we need to admit we don't know how or what to pray. Jesus said, apart from, you, apart from me, you can do nothing. And that includes even something as simple as praying. The second attitude is that we wait for God. And here there's two subpoints. Expect God to speak to you. As you wait in an attitude of, of prayer, expect God to speak to you, telling you what and how to pray. And then secondly, allow Him to change your heart. You see, sometimes we don't pray in the Spirit because we're praying at cross purposes with God. We want this, and this is what God wants. And as long as we insist on praying this, we will not be praying in the Spirit. Here's an example that parents might understand. Say you're a parent of, of little children. You have a young child who is past his bedtime, he's already crabby, and you have a party at your place, and somebody brings out the Coke, just as your kid's supposed to be going to bed, he's kind of a Coke fiend. Okay. But you know how some kids react to caffeine? They can do laps at the, on, the, on the walls at the ceiling level. You've seen those kids, right? <laughs> Happens that your kid is one of them. Now, you know if you give them any Coke to drink, you're going to be in for hours of screaming. This isn't going to go well. So when he asks for Coke, are you going to give it to him? Somebody says yes. Oh, <laughs> No. Okay, now, does it matter 
how many times he asks, are you going to change your mind? You're not, right? Are you wavering? No, you're not. What needs to change? What needs to change? If somebody says, give him water. The kid don't want stupid water. He wants Coke. Like, what kind of lame idea is that to give him water? What needs to change? His mind needs to change. His attitude needs to change. He needs to not want Coke anymore and go to bed and shut up. <laughs> Oh, you can see I'm great with kids. <laughs> okay, it doesn't matter how often he's going to ask. You're not giving him coke because it's not good for him at that point. We wait for God. We wait and we expect him to speak to us and we allow him to change our hearts so that we will pray in the direction that he wants. And a biblical example of this is Acts chapter 13. In the church at Antioch, they were, there were prophets and teachers. And while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Here the church was gathering in prayer, and they were waiting. And they heard God speak to them, telling them to set apart Paul and Barnabas. Now, I'll never forget the day that God taught me about this very, very plainly. It was, uh, we were in Kelowna. Uh, I was a pastor there. And there was this young fellow who was, uh, who was connected to our church. And he loved to come into the office and tell me how committed to Satan he was. And how he, was, uh, he had devoted his life to the destruction that Satan would bring in Kelowna. And he would tell me about the crimes and the fights and the destruction that his, his life was bringing. And I wanted to help this guy. I didn't know what to do. But a friend was traveling through from Calgary, and I, I said, can you stay an extra day and help me face this situation? And he said, sure. I'll stay an extra day. He phoned his wife and said, I'll be home another a day late and uh, he said let's get together after supper and we'll pray so you know I fed the kids supper and we got together to pray we pray pray, pray for this little bit and then he turns to me and he says okay so what did God say to you I said like like what <laughs> like was, was he supposed to say something I didn't know I thought we were just praying and he said, well, that's, that's what happens when you pray. He said, we don't know what to do. We don't know how to face this thing tomorrow. We don't know what to do. We need God to show us, to direct us. He said, pray again, and this time listen for Pete's sake. So we pray again. And all that happens is these two verses keep coming to my mind but they don't make any sense. So he says, okay, uh, did God say anything to you? And I'm, okay, I'm not sure. And he's, well, here's a verse that came to my mind. And then I said, okay, here's two verses that came to my mind. And again, ooh, it didn't make any sense. So he says, well, all we've done is remembered a little parts of the verse. Let's read the whole thing. And when we read the whole thing, it became absolutely clear and obvious what we were supposed to do. And so we prayed in that direction. And then this kid that we were trying to deal with, he would tend to be up all night causing all kinds of destruction and crime and stuff. And then he'd normally get up at four in the afternoon to begin the cycle over again. So we prayed, and the next morning... 8 o'clock in the morning, this kid phones me and says, Russ, I want to meet you for breakfast today. And make a long story short, he met with my friend and myself for breakfast. After about four hours of meeting with him, he came to a point where he renounced his dedication to Satan 
and he invited Christ into his life. All of that happened because my friend said, you got to listen when you're praying. And I, those verses did not make sense to me until we started putting it together. And then we knew exactly what to do. We need to learn that prayer is a two-way conversation with God. Kierkegaard once observed, he said, a man prayed, and at first he thought praying was talking, but, be, uh, but he became more and more quiet until the end. in the end he realized that prayer is listening. Praying in the Spirit involves us being able to hear God so that he can direct our prayers and actions. Has this ever happened to you where you, you think, oh, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really pray. And you pray for everything you've got and maybe even some of it twice. And it feels like you've been praying for a really long time. You look at your watch. Oh, that was three minutes. Does that happen to you? That happens to me. Why? Because... A one-way conversation is boring and dull. And it seems to go on forever. How long do you talk on the phone when you don't know that there's anybody on the other end of the line? You hang up, right? You need to hear the other person's voice to have a conversation. The same thing with prayer. Prayer is transformed when it's moved from a monologue to a dialogue. Uh, when our one daughter hit grade seven, all of a sudden uh, she went through what looked to us like a, 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 a very intense, rebellious uh, time. And I, we were trying to address it, and the more we addressed it, the worse it got. And so, you know, I'm praying about this, and one day I'm praying about it, and God says to me, it was Okay, what do I mean when I say God says things to me? What I mean is there was a very direct and strong thought that went opposite the direction of what I would normally think. And he said, uh, what, what the thought was, was, your daughter's not rebellious. This is a, a, a self-esteem issue. And you need to address that. And when you address that, there's other stuff will all take care of itself. And so we found out later, well, basically that day, one of her teachers had publicly humiliated her and, and caused all the other kids to start uh, humiliating her. We addressed that. We addressed her self-esteem. And uh, re what uh, we thought was a rebellion was cleared up instantly. I would have had no clue. I would have been keeping on addressing rebellion, and it would have been a disaster. My friends, praying in the Spirit begins with God. We don't know how or what to pray, but God tells us. He tells us what He wants us to ask for, what we can ask Him to do. Our part is to agree with Him and then do what He says. So the attitudes in prayer are, first of all, we admit that we don't know what or how to pray. Secondly, we wait on Him expecting that He will speak and allow Him to change our hearts. And then third, we pray in faith. Believe that Jesus or that God will answer your prayers. Uh, not the prayers that express only what we want, but the prayer that God has laid upon our hearts. Now look at this verse and see if this verse doesn't seem a little bit messed up to you. Jesus said this, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe you have received it and it will be yours. You notice something strange about that verse? Future tense, past tense, future tense. Ask for it. Uh, uh, but say, uh, whatever you ask for in prayer, that's future. Believe that you have received it. Shouldn't it be believe that you will receive it? And it'll be yours. Why does Jesus throw in the past tense there? Now, the answer to that's a whole sermon, but let me just give you the quick, the quick answer. And the quick answer is that the answer is so certain 
that you can talk about it as if it's already happened. Believe that you have received it and it'll be yours. James talks about that same kind of confidence in prayer. If any of you asks, uh, lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like the wave of a sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. There must be a confidence, an unwavering expectation. We have faith. Now, how does that work? We can't force ourselves to have faith. Sometimes a person may read a verse like this, a promise like this, and pray about something, ask for what he wants, and then try to convince himself to believe that God has heard his prayer. But this only ends in disappointment. I, I know I've done that a bunch of times. It ends in disappointment because it's not real faith. It's just kind of wishful thinking. When this happens, many people uh, kind of lose their trust in God. When the thing they've made themselves believe is going to happen doesn't happen, they come to the conclusion that God doesn't answer prayer. That the, the very foundation of their prayer life is shaken. Trying to believe something we want to believe is not faith. Believing what God says in his word is faith. True faith comes because it's a gift from God. It comes from hearing God speaking to us through his word, uh, through strong impressions he puts into our lives. So how do we pray in the spirit? Well, first of all, you admit that you do not know how and what to pray as you should. That takes all the pressure off. You don't have to impress God with how good of a prayer you are. You don't have to come up with all the right phrases and, and the, the, the right sense of intensity. You just said, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray for on this thing. And then wait on God to teach you, expecting that he will speak and allow him to change your heart. And then third, pray believing that he's going to answer. Even look to him to give you a measure of faith. Now, before we close, I want to draw one more verse to your attention. It's Luke 11, verse 9. It says, Jesus speaking, So I say to you, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. This verse deals with what we've been talking about today, and it's Jesus' formula for prayer. Ask, seek, knock. Now, I read this in a book by Lloyd Ogilvy, I don't know, 35 years ago, and it's impacted my life and my prayer life very deeply. Where do we start with prayer? We start by asking. Our, our prayers normally start with what we want. We simply ask God to give us what we want. But when the answer is not coming, we move to seeking. Seeking is asking God, what do you want? Here's where prayer moves to a two-way conversation. We expect God to speak to us, to show us how and what he wants us to pray. Then we move to knocking. Knocking is surrendering the direction we received from him and saying, okay, God, I'm going to just do it. I'm going to do what you said. I'm going to pray what you said. So we move from, God, this is what I want, to God, what is it that you want, to, okay, God, that's what I'll do. Now, let me just illustrate this very clearly so you understand what I'm talking about. Say I go to the doctor this week, tomorrow, and the doctor says, bad news, Russ, uh, you got cancer, the kind that, yeah, six months maybe. Okay, so first response is I pray. In that case, what do I pray? <laughs> I get you to pray too, right? What do we pray? God, heal them. All right, we're starting with I want. What do I want? I want to be healed. I hope and you want that too. Okay, but say two months from now, the whites of my eyes are turning yellow. My skin is turning yellow. My liver is taking a break. And it looks like six months might be optimistic. What happens? Where do we, where do we pray then? Okay, we start to pray, okay, God, what's going on with this stuff? What do you want to have happen here? 
And maybe in that whole process, God says, what I'm doing is I'm working in the lives of people around about us. And I am dealing with their faith. And as they see the peace and the grace that he goes through this dying process with, I'm going to do a powerful thing in their lives. I'm not saying this stuff is easy. Getting to that second point, Lord, what do you want? It's always tough. The, the greater we care about it, the tougher it is. But then we come to a point where we say, okay, God, I'll pray according to what you want, what you're doing. I'll pray for my neighbors in this situation that your peace and your grace will work in their lives. Now, if we get stuck in the asking phase, and lots of us get stuck there once in a while, if we get lost or get stuck in the asking phase, we end up confused and bitter and disillusioned with God. Jesus' formula for prayer. Ask, you start with what you want. When that's not happening, then you move to, to the seek. Okay, God, what is it that you want to do? And then the knock is once you've heard him. And then you can pray. This is, that's where that past tense part of the prayer comes in. Because once you've heard him, the prayer is so certain, you can talk about it as if it's already happened. So the, Holy, or the, the New Testament teaches us to pray in the Holy Spirit. These three attitudes are, are what makes it happen. We begin with, I don't know how to pray. Okay, God, I'm waiting on you. And I'm going to do what you, what you say. Let's close with a, a song.